Now, one final way to change power is using what are called directional hypotheses. This will have an effect very similar to changing our alpha level, but will do so in such a way to not affect our false alarm rate. So going back to the statistical hypotheses I showed you before, these are what are known as non-directional statistical hypotheses. Specifically, looking at the alternative, notice our alternative doesn't make a prediction about the direction of an effect. We're not saying whether treatment will be higher or lower than without treatment, simply that it won't be equal to without treatment. However, we can restructure our statistical hypotheses in this way. Rather than simply stating that the mean with treatment is not equal to the mean without treatment, we can put a directional hypothesis there, that the mean after treatment is greater than the mean without treatment. Notice the null hypothesis had to change. Since these have to be mutually exclusive and exhaustive, the null hypothesis states now that the mean for the treated population is less than or equal to the mean without treatment. Notice these are still statistically valid. They're mutually exclusive and exhaustive. One of these has to be true, and only one of these can be true. Now the consequence of doing this is that if we look at our distribution of the Z statistic under the null hypothesis, if we're predicting that we will increase IQ scores, we're simply going to allocate all of alpha to the upper tail. And notice what happens to the critical value on the upper side. I'll go back. Our Z critical in the positive direction was positive 1.96, when we use a non-directional or a two-tailed hypothesis. If we're using a directional hypothesis, that is a one-tailed test, then our z-critical shifts towards zero, that is, it's positive 1.64. Now if we look at our two distribution diagram, notice what happens. Here we are with alpha of 0.05 using a non-directional, the two-tailed hypothesis that we've seen all along. I'll shift this to be a one-tailed or a directional hypothesis. And notice that we're counting more of the samples under the alternative hypothesis as evidence against the null. But we're doing this in such a way that we're not changing the false alarm rate if the null hypothesis is true. Now we don't always have to have directional hypotheses going in the positive direction. I can switch this and instead of saying the mean after treatment is greater than the mean without treatment, here I'm saying the mean after treatment is less than the mean without treatment. Still mutually exclusive and exhaustive, but notice that the null hypothesis had to change to absorb the rest of the area. Going back to our diagram, rather than having the critical region in the positive direction, that alternative hypothesis would allocate all of alpha into the negative tail. Now this would be a situation where we're predicting that we actually are going to hurt people's IQ. So, looking at that other diagram, where we phrase it as though we were going to reduce IQ, notice what happens from a non-directional two-tailed test when we shift to a one-tailed or directional hypothesis test. Again, we're counting more of the samples under the alternative hypothesis as counting as evidence against the null. I'll shift back and forth so you can see the change. Here we are with the non-directional or two-tailed test, and here we are with the directional test. So, if we specify one of these directional hypotheses, that is the mean after treatment less than the mean without treatment, or the mean after treatment greater than the mean without treatment, then we're actually able to allocate alpha in one particular direction, which makes our critical region just a little bit bigger in that tail. So we have to, if we're doing a directional hypothesis, specify the direction of the effect before we do the study. So we'll be using one of these pairs of hypotheses. Notice that in each of the pairs, they're mutually exclusive and exhaustive. But when we're doing a study, we have to specify this beforehand. Now you might think, given that we can increase our power without increasing our false alarm rate, that we should always use a directional hypothesis. Now there are some very good reasons not to use a directional statistical hypothesis. One of them is a fairly statistical point, and the other is a fairly pragmatic point. But let me go forward to some of the characteristics of directional hypotheses. The first is that you have to specify them before running a study. This is in part to be ethical and in part to keep us from inflating our false alarm rate without knowing it. Now, the other point is that effects in the other direction than you specify need to be unimportant, uninteresting, or simply conceptually unlikely. And we'll look at why this condition has to be true in order to use a directional test. Finally, the pragmatic point, the potential for abuse of directional tests, something I'll show you in just a second, makes them suspect to many researchers.
So, it's considerably harder to defend the use of a directional test versus a standard, non-directional test. Let's look at some of those potentials for abuse, some of which are active and some of which are accidental. All right, let's imagine a situation where we've specified a directional, one-tailed test in the positive direction. We think this is where the effect is going to be, and so we are allocating our entire critical region into that positive tail. At this point, looking at this distribution under the null hypothesis, we can say that if the null is true, we will false alarm 5% of the time. Everything looks okay so far. Suppose we get a result like this, a z sub x bar that's far in the negative direction, negative 2.4. And you remember that your negative z critical would have been negative 1.96 had you specified a two-tailed test. So you think you're licensed to reject the null hypothesis here. Certainly that z sub x bar is unlikely to happen by chance alone, and it even exceeds your stricter two-tailed criterion on the other side. But notice that something problematic is happening here. Imagine we have 100 researchers doing 100 studies. If we allowed those 100 researchers to change their mind after the fact, to switch from a one-tailed test to a two-tailed test, well, they wouldn't just false alarm 5% of the time if the null hypothesis is true. Certainly, they would false alarm that 5% of the time in the upper tail because they specified that as their critical region, but if they're allowed to change their mind, they will also false alarm this 0.025 proportion of the time that's less than the negative z critical on the other side. So, for these 100 researchers, the overall false alarm rate wouldn't be 0.05, it would actually be 0.075. So, we can't allow people to change their mind after the fact. And this is a very hard thing to detect. Notice that if somebody publishes the result saying that they did a two-tailed test and rejected on the negative side, you have no idea whether they started with a directional test to start with. So, even though they report their alpha as being 0.05 with a non-directional test, their chance of false alarming was actually higher. This is bad for science. Remember, we're doing this hypothesis test to protect science from false alarms. That's the worst thing that can happen from a perspective of a scientist, because that will confuse or clutter the scientific literature with results that are really simply due to chance. Now let's look at another situation, one that's a little bit worse, and one that researchers should really know better about. Suppose you started off with a non-directional or a two-tailed test, and you get a result right here, a frustrating result right before you hit the critical value. So a z sub x bar at 1.7. Now notice, if we allow this researcher or all researchers to change their mind and believe that they would have specified a directional test, and we're all good at confirmation bias, we can all convince ourselves that we really would have predicted a direction in this way, then this researcher might think that they can change their z critical to positive 1.64. That's where they would have had it had they specified a directional hypothesis. Now here's the problem. The true alpha is at least 0.075 if we allow researchers to do this. But notice that on the negative side, this researcher may also have convinced themselves that they would have predicted in this direction. Again, this is confirmation bias. Once we see a result, we can convince ourselves that we would have predicted it. So across all researchers, if we allow them to change their alpha here, now to negative 1.64 as their critical value, which would have been the critical value with a directional hypothesis in that tail, across all researchers, the true alpha is actually 0 0.10, twice as large as the alpha they will state. Now this is terrible. This is bad for science because these individuals will state that they performed a one-tailed test and they specified the direction of the effect before they did a study, but in fact, they changed their mind. And so across all researchers, the probability of a false alarm is double what they're stating it to be. And remember, we're trying to protect science and we want to characterize the likelihood of a false alarm correctly when we're publishing results. We want people to know what standard of evidence our result actually achieved, not the one that happened after we opportunistically changed our hypothesis. And so this is the reason why directional tests are a little suspect to researchers. If you see a directional test in the literature, we often wonder, did that person simply change their mind after the fact because a two-tailed test didn't let them reject the null?
So my recommendation is to stay away from directional tests. And perhaps it's even better to argue on a purely statistical ground. Even though we may think we know the direction of an effect, really, we're trying to characterize how unlikely a result is due to sampling error. And sampling error that's in the positive direction or the negative direction is still sampling error. So in reality, our hypothesis test should be about how unlikely sampling error could have caused our particular result if the null hypothesis is true. And a non-directional test is what characterizes that. The p-value we get from a non-directional test properly characterizes how unlikely our result would be if the null hypothesis was true. So we have many factors that affect power, and some of these are more or less under our control. The size of the effect in the population is generally not something we can change, but sometimes it is. Suppose we're doing a study on the effect of a drug. Rather than give our individuals 10 milligrams of the drug, what if we gave them 100 milligrams? Assuming that it's a safe dose, we want to give the maximum amount of the drug in order to measure the effect, since larger effects will be easier to find. The variability in the populations isn't usually under our control, but sometimes we can change our experimental situation to reduce the amount of extraneous variability we measure. Now sample size, alpha level, and directional hypotheses are under our control. So when possible, we want to set these values such that we maximize the amount of power we have. Given what I've told you about factors affecting power, check your understanding with this question. Which of the following is guaranteed not to increase power. I'll let you read these and I'll follow up with the answer in the next video.